I'm Arnold Lehman. I'm director of the Brooklyn Museum, for those of you I don't know. And it is um, a, actually a very great honor. I think that's the right word. And an equally great delight to have you all here today uh, to celebrate something very important um, to the Brooklyn Museum, very important to the city of New York, and I think very important to everyone um, who is thinking about things. Uh, and that is the third anniversary of the opening of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Uh, before I go any further, um, I just wonder if it would be an imposition to ask, so those people scattered about there, if you would be willing to move forward. If you're not, not to worry, but it just sort of is, <laughs> it would just seem um, it's so much easier when, when a crowd and audience is together rather than scattered like this. And we are, as you very well know, because you got here, competing with the most gorgeous day of the entire year. Not that that's a good enough reason not to be here, um, but I'm, I'm glad you all are. Um, today, while we very proudly look back on three years of leadership and exceptional exhibitions, programs, and events, we also are celebrating feminism and its future. And what better way of doing that than by inviting some of the most significant voices in this dialogue from the past decade to join us here today in looking forward and in envisioning feminism's place in the cultural world of the second decade of the 21st century and perhaps even beyond. Um, in a moment, I will invite our trustee and great friend Elizabeth Sackler to introduce today's speakers. But before I do, I'd like to take a moment to thank Elizabeth for her incredible vision and commitment to the realization of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. It hardly seems possible that it's been, uh, I don't know if it's been a year or a decade uh, since Elizabeth and I started brainstorming about building a center devoted to feminist art. From those earliest discussions, when we both knew that we wanted to do so um, and to find a permanent home for Judy Chicago's magnificent and iconic dinner party, um, taking that all the way to the current installation of Kiki Smith's Sojourn um, in the fourth floor feminist art galleries, no one could have had a more distinct, innovative, or expansive, expansive conceptualization than Elizabeth of what needed to be done. The accolade visionary is perhaps too often used today to acknowledge forward-thinking ideas. But in Elizabeth's case, visionary is perhaps actually an understatement in describing what she has accomplished here in collaboration with the Brooklyn Museum and with those very many hardworking museum professionals who share this vision. And by this point in time, after these years here, everyone in this museum, I believe, does share that vision. However, along with the word vision, there could be no appropriate description offered that did not also immediately and necessarily add the words vibrant, engaging, powerful, and inclusive. While these might sound like the praise given to a new film in a newspaper, here they are the very essence of what the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art was both meant to be and has, to our enormous delight, become. It is, again, with equal amounts of pride and pleasure that I welcome our trustee, my very good friend, Elizabeth Sackler, to the podium. Every year it gets better and better. Thank you, Arnold. 
Um, before you leave, I, I want you to stay here. This is an anniversary. This is a birthday in, in many ways. I don't know whether or not we would call it an anniversary or birthday, but it, it does mark a relationship. It marks the birth of a new life. And on birthdays and anniversaries, we pay tribute to partners and to children, and we thank a person uh, or people without whom there would be no cause to celebrate at all. So I want to take this opportunity um, to in ad additionally and publicly uh, thank my muse, uh, Steve Robinson, and of course the great Judy Chicago, each having actively participated um, at inception or conception, depending <laughs> on how you look at what we have done. But um, I have to thank the man who I say um, has become the father of this great achievement, uh, the Center for Feminist Art, and that, of course, is Arnold uh, Lehman. So for me, in gratitude to you for your support, your enthusiasm, your coddling and cuddling, your disciplining, your unconditional love. I'm going to say that because you are. You are our biggest supporter of what the center is, what we do, and how we do it. I'm going to present to Arnold, which I have to duck down here and get, a very small uh, token and a personal token uh, of my gratitude to you and um, to the museum, but to you especially. So. I'm ducking down here and pulling out a white bag oh my goodness. and giving this to you. And you'll have a chance to take a look at it more closely. But anyway, this is for Arnold. Oh, how beautiful. Yeah, well, you'll see. OK. <laughs> but I'll help you down the stairs with it. Maybe I can put it down there. But I want to thank Arnold. And I think we should all thank Arnold. Because without Arnold, um, without Arnold, there, without Arnold there, there would not be a center for feminist art. Thank you, Elizabeth. But it is Elizabeth. <laughs> well, actually, it, it's um, it, this is it's pretty gutsy. It was pretty gutsy of me to do it. But it's a monoprint, and it's a monoprint that I made actually in 2008 um, in Portugal when I was taking a uh, an, eth an a workshop there, and. Um, when I made it, I did it, and I looked at it, and I drew uh, with a pencil afterwards a little arrow that said underneath it, to find a perfect man. <laughs> Arnold is the perfect man. Now, if I may say one thing, we're all friends here. I'm so glad that this gift came from that period of Elizabeth's participation uh, instead of the boxing. <laughs> yeah, I'm a boxer now, so he doesn't want to mess with me. So for the scores of you uh, and those some who aren't here who might be enjoying this beautiful day, I thank you for coming. But you know that um, my welcomes and introductions to all of our panel discussions and programming um, are, always begin with my saying. The Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art is an exhibition space, a permanent home of the dinner party and feminist art space. We are an educational facility dedicated to feminist art, and our mission is to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions, to educate new generations about the meaning of feminist art, and to host lectures and discussions on feminist activism. That is how I begin all of my welcomes and introductions, and today is no different than that. So, I'd like to welcome you. This is a panel discussion celebrating the third anniversary of the Center, and the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art is an exhibition space, permanent home of the dinner party, feminist art space, and education facility dedicated to feminist art, and you know our mission. And I thank you so much for being here to support that. You know, um, one year ago, it was our second anniversary, I introduced Catherine Morris, Catherine's here, um, as our then new curator. Um, Catherine, I just want to say it has been a real pleasure working with you this past year, and I'm looking forward to many more years of collegiality. You have brought excellence, you have brought intelligence, you have brought grace and enthusiasm. And I want to thank you 
for all of that because it's, it's really giving us enormous uh, strength and possibilities for the future. And your staff, including Sarah Giovanelli, is she here? Sarah, I just saw Sarah come in. Sarah, Sarah's been here practically since the beginning of time with the center. And I want to thank you and your staff for everything you do. I know you work tirelessly, and it's very, very much appreciated. So I thank you. Radia Harper, I don't know if she's in the auditorium today, but even if she isn't, I say to her, what a journey. And I thank her. She's head of the education department. She, I, I thank her for her love of our mission. She has come to support and facilitate our vision and the mission of the center in a way that maybe I couldn't have anticipated three years ago when we began, and it has been invaluable. Uh, Charles, Kevin, Cynthia, Sally, Adam, and the board of trustees of the Brooklyn, I thank all. Um, we couldn't exist without the commitment of all of those people. And I also want to add my thanks and my love for the team of security guards here. Um, I've come to know them over the years. We broke ground, I don't know, seven years ago. And um, I know many of them. I don't know all of them in the whole museum, but there are about a half a dozen or so that I have come to know. And they're very proud of the center. And they love engaging um, in talking with, with people who come to visit. And I consider them to be a, a very lively part of the center's family. So uh, I just want to say that. On the home front, Rebecca Taffel, who is here. She's sitting next to Catherine. She is at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. And she has been brilliant. She's committed to all that she does. She knows everything that's going on, and she knows everyone who's going on with everything that we're doing. And she's fabulous to work with. It's been a pleasure for me. She is the future of the foundation, as is her endless participation, insisting in the center's growth. She works very closely with museum personnel, and it's been a pleasure, and I thank you, Rebecca. This year marks the activation and organization of our Council for Feminist Art, which is a very, very exciting thing for us. It's a fantastic group getting on the, in on the ground floor um, to help the, with the center's uh, growth and to enhance the acquisitions uh, for the center. And as far as I'm concerned, we have a goal. And the goal that we have is to collect the most important collection of feminist art in the world, and to have it, to house it, and to hold it for future, for future generations. So thank you to our charter members and those of you who will or might become um, members of the council. We're going to be coming up with different tiers, so we hope that we will be able to incorporate anybody who is interested in supporting uh, different aspects of the center. Uh, after today's panel, we're going to have a toast of wine at the center to, you know, for our third birthday. So I hope that you'll join us. Um, I've made a note here, and I wrote it this morning, and I think it's true that with this center, we have broken a glass ceiling, and we have challenged others, other museums and uh, galleries, to do the same. And I'm proud and pleased that today's program programming was shaped and organized um, by the adult programs team, who worked tirelessly throughout the year in assisting and facilitating the center's uh, programming. And that's, that's sort of a first. I have, had been sort of responsible for putting together our um, anniversary programming. But this year, uh, Chazlin Ong and Elizabeth Koke, who I'd like to thank very, very much for your, for your activation of this program today, and they've been instrumental in it, and for Catherine's participation, too. And so today, we are seeing, as you know, Red Stocking, Riot Girls, and Right Now, Three Generations of Feminism in Conversation, moderated by Jennifer Baumgardner and Amy Richards, featuring eminent panelists Alex Kate Schulman, Farai Chidea, and Marissa Meltzer. 
Amy and Jennifer have worked together on various projects since they met in 1993 as 22-year-olds at Ms. Magazine. Jennifer was an intern at Ms. And while Amy worked down the hall in Gloria Steinem's office. And Gloria has been an enormous, a huge, a wonderful fan and friend of the center. Um, and it's wonderful to have b both Amy and Jennifer here. Uh, in October, a book they co-wrote about the state of the women's movement, Manifesta, Young Women, Feminism, and the Future, was published and served as the platform for a national speaking tour which brought them to dozens of community groups, countless bookstores, and more than 200 universities and high schools. They founded Soapbox Inc., I love that, Speakers Who Speak Out in 2002. Their second co-authored book, Grassroots, a Field Guide for Feminist Activism, was published in 2005. Amy is the co-founder of the Third Wave Foundation, and we have partnered with the Third Wave Foundation and in many different ways over the last few years. And she is also the voice behind As Amy, an online column at, fem is it feminist.com or is it feminista? It's feminista. There were, there, hmm? Feminist.com. So this is great. We have two. We have a feminist.com and we have a feminista.com. So we're, there are two dot coms um, that are raring to go here. This is terrific. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. The project director of Anna Dear Smith's Twilight in Los Angeles and the author of Opting In, Having a Child Without Losing Yourself. That's to be read. I have to give one to my daughter. She just had my third grandchild, so I have to look for that. Jennifer writes for dozens of magazines. Where are you, Jennifer? I'm just, there you are, hi. Um, including Glamour, The Nation, which we all love, Real Simple and Harper's. She's the creator of the I Had an Abortion Project, the author of uh, Look Both Ways, Bisexual Politics, which was done uh, published in 2007, and Abortion and Life, which was published in 2008. She is currently working on um, a film and awareness project called I Was Raped. Amy and Jennifer live in New York with their families. Um, before I invite them to come up, I would like to just say a few words and give you some of my thoughts. I was looking at the cover of this and the title of this manifesta and feminista and matron instead of patron of the arts. And because um, when people ask me or say, or say that I'm a patron of the arts, first of all, I don't consider myself a patron of the arts, but I say, well, if I'm anything, I'm a matron of the arts. And they say, oh, you're being so literal. And I say, well, it is the literalness of words. Words are literal. All men are created equal, meant then. All men are created equal. And of course, we know they meant all white men are created equal. In literature and in scholarly writing, the use of he and him meant he and him. The, uh, the idea that, no, 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 it really meant she and her was sort of a way of getting around an embarrassment of what became a politically incorrect blah, 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 blah. I won't go on, you all know it. But I think what, it, what the point is, is how language, um, the ways in which language uh, subverts equality. And we are so accustomed to that that we sometimes don't even notice it. So to my mind, it's not about fussiness. It's really about um, accuracy. And I think um, as we attempt to take back the night, we must forever be diligent about taking back our language as well as our wall space. So with those few thoughts, please join me in welcoming Jennifer and Amy. Thank you so much. So 
that's perfect, Marisa. So that was supposed. To, that's where you're supposed to sit, right? And Alex, you're right there, and Farai's in the middle, and Amy's on the stage right end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Jennifer Baumgartner. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm going to introduce the panel and say a few words to orient you a little bit more to Manifesta, Young Women Feminism in the Future, which is um, celebrating its 10-year anniversary this year, and there's a new edition of it. Amy and I are really excited. It was a book we wrote in, it was published in 2000, and when it was published in 2000, we never dreamed that it would be, that people would still be buying it and reading it, so we feel very fortunate. Um, I'm gonna back up a little and say a little bit about who Amy and I are, because I think it says a little bit about feminism. Um, and how integrated feminism is just into the, in the water, which is the phrase we use in Manifesta. It's, it's common in a lot of ways, and its power has been there for so long, we often don't even know it's there, even though we're benefiting from it. And that was definitely true for, for Amy and myself. So Amy and I grew up in entirely different kinds of families, or at least superficially different families, um, far away from each other. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and she grew up in central Pennsylvania. And um, the superficial differences were that my, I, my parents were a nuclear family. My parents met when they were in seventh grade, got married in college. You know, they waited until college. Um, and my dad was the breadwinner. My mom was a stay-at-home mother of three daughters. And nonetheless, at a certain point in her life, basically Ms. Magazine came into her life. But the larger thing was that feminism came into her life. There were all these social justice movements come, going on. She felt a little isolated from them in her home in Fargo uh, with her three kids. And Ms. was suddenly at the grocery store and it, it magnetized a lot of the conversations or thoughts she had been having about her own life. Namely, she wondered how much she had even really chosen that life. She grew up wondering, thinking she could be a teacher or a nurse. Her mom was a nurse, so she became a teacher. Um, it didn't even occur to her not to take her husband's name. And while she loved her family and her husband, she wondered if she had really um, tapped into all of the potential of, of what could have been a passion for her. What, what were her talents and was she really expressing them? Um, and so I was born and raised by a mom who was actively trying to figure out her identity. Amy's mom, on the other hand, left her, Amy's father before Amy was born. Amy's never met her father. And this was before there were MTV shows for single, teen single mothers um, celebrating it. <laughs> and so Amy's mom was a single mother in a time when it didn't um, have that kind of maybe occasionally positive or any sort of attention that, w that wasn't negative. And in fact, when Amy's mother left her father, she was counseled by her parents and other people who were trying to do the best thing for her to, to arrange an adoption. There's no way that Amy's mother could raise Amy and you know, do a good job. And Amy's mom said, no, I'm gonna raise her on my own, and she did. And our two moms who had women's groups and read the women's room, you know, they, and, and kind of were being affected by feminism at the same time. They also managed to express these two values of feminism that I think are very important, of second wave feminism that are very crucial. My mother, through laundry strikes and um, refusing to pick us up when we called her and not making cookies, even though the mom down the street made cookies and I was kind of embarrassed that my mom wouldn't make cookies for us, by refusing to, by making her labor, withdrawing her labor occasionally, and making her labor visible, was making the things that women do visible, traditional women's work visible, and maybe valued and maybe more understood by her daughters. Um, and while it was embarrassing to me as a child, I now look back and I'm really grateful that my mom did do that and, and led us into to her struggles. Amy's mother, on the other hand, showed that given the opportunity or the necessity, women can do anything men can do. She bought the house and paid the mortgage. She bought the car. She, you know, if there was a mouse, she trapped it and she put the mouse in the garbage. There weren't jobs that were gendered in Amy's house because there wasn't a man. And so that was a very liberating example in a lot of ways for Amy to grow up seeing. Um, there were, you know, other things that, you know, other reverberations, I guess, of the fact that we were raised in these feminist influence households, and the one that's popping into my head right now about Amy is that when she was about five, her teacher asked her, it, it asked the class if anyone knew the, um, how to sing the national anthem, and Amy raised her hand and she said, I am woman, hear me roar in numbers too, because her mother had told her that that was the national anthem. Um, and 
in my household in Fargo, for some reason, we talked about abortion rights a lot, like at the dinner table. That was like a big part of our conversation. And the way it would play out in my life is that my Barbies were always getting abortions. <laughs> and I would go to school and I would, we would have to do you know, speeches where people argued different sides for a speech and I would argue the pro-choice side, but you know, I was the only person on my side. And people were like, why is that fourth grader always talking about abortion? <laughs> but it was, it was a reflection of these interesting feminist conversations that were going on even in our homes. Um, when Amy and I got to Ms. as 22-year-olds, we, we were really both so thrilled to be there. By this point, we consciously called ourselves feminists. We weren't just kind of picking up on the reverberations. We were really thrilled to be in hubs of feminist organizing. And um, in a way, we were sort of thrilled to be the teacher's pets of the second wave. That was sort of, someone called us that once, and we were like, that's sort of true. It felt really great for a while. Um, we were the, the younger people in the room. Um, providing the young feminist viewpoint. And for a while it felt so great and it felt so powerful to get to be that one young feminist in the room or those two young feminists in the room that we kind of went along with the concept that maybe there weren't that many young feminists. It was really just the two of us. We're so great. Um, but as we matured, we, f we started to feel like there was more of a conflict between what we were talking about in these um, second wave institutions that we were really, really happy to be a part of and what was going on in the rest of our lives. And the conflict was really that we saw feminism all around us, and that in fact we saw our peers, men and women, living really feminist lives, whether or not they were using that language to describe it. And expressing feminism in interesting ways, and maybe in ways that our mother's generation would, would not have imagined for us. Um, and so the reason we wrote Manifesto was in many ways to reconcile that conflict, to describe the feminism that we saw around us and to document it for, for ourselves primarily, but for, for a generation uh, or to, you know, to start doing that. And this wonderful thing happened when we wrote the book, which is that we got invited to go give lectures at lots of colleges and high schools and community centers. And we got to learn so much more from those conversations and from that touring than had even gone into the book. And so the book had this life that went far beyond what we wrote and this conversation about feminism just kept growing and growing and growing for us. Um, and that, that's been really exciting and an honor um, to get to continue to learn by having these conversations and this relationship that um, feminism, knowing that you believe in feminism or trying to figure out feminism really can provide. Um, one of the things that's been sort of interesting that's happened to Amy and I a lot as we've gotten s slightly more prominent um, is that I mean, we're so not prominent, so I'm always like, does that sound <laughs> weird, but um, slightly more prominent, is that when, when women of the second wave um, who are older have died, like in the last decade, actually, a lot of very prominent second wave leaders have died. Betty Friedan, Andrea Dworkin, um, uh, June Jordan, just a ton of very important people who were, who were quite famous have, have died. And, and when someone passes, we do often get calls from journalists saying, you know, so-and-so died, and they were so important for this one generation of feminism, they were leaders, and who are the leaders in your generation? And we always think it's so almost insulting, because they're calling us, but they're like, we know it's not you, but can you point <laughs> us or give us the phone number of who it is? Um, but we always say, you're right, it isn't us. Because, and then we quote Alice Rossi from the Feminist Papers, because the public heroines of one generation become just the private citizens of the next. And we can all be the Betty Friedans and the June Jordans of our community and of our lives nowadays. And that's the wonderful thing about all of the progress, I think, that we've seen because of feminism. Um, and it's also, it's a challenge to, to go on and to make something with that, with that gift that we've been given of a more feminist world. Um, now I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, I'm going to start with Alex Schulman, who's right here, the stage left person. Um, for 40 years, Alex Kate Shulman has been a feminist activist um, in Red Stockings, Witch, New York Radical Women, and other pioneering women's liberation groups. And she's a writer, an incredible writer. In 1971, her biography of Emma Goldman to the Barricades was named an outstanding book by the New York Times. And the following year, she published Memoirs of an Ex-Prom Queen, a novel portraying the sexual and social predicament faced by young middle-class women in the pre-feminist 1950s. It sold over a million copies. 
and it was issued recently uh, uh, under the aegis of the Feminist Classics series, and I got to write the intro, which was a big honor. Besides four novels, she's written three memoirs, most recently To Love What Is, um, a book that recounts caring for her beloved husband who suffered a traumatic brain injury in 2004. Besides being his primary caregiver and blogging about it for Psychology Today, she's working on a comic novel, her fifth, about second waivers in their old age. <laughs> Farai Chidea, who is to her right, um, or to the left if you're looking, um, has, combined media technology, has combined media, technology, and social justice during her 20-year career as an award-winning author and journalist. She is a contributor to the public radio show The Takeaway, and I listen to that all the time, and a frequent lecturer and consultant on digital media strategy at corporations, universities, and nonprofits. Um, she recently and for quite a while hosted NPR's News and Notes, a daily national program about African American and African diaspora issues. She has won awards including the National Education Reporting Award, a North Star News Prize, and a special award from the National Gay and Lesbian Journalists Association for coverage of AIDS. She's written three nonfiction books, Trust, Reaching the 100 Million Voters, The 100 Million Missing Voters, The Color of Our Future, and Don't Believe the Hype, Fighting Cultural Misinformation About African Americans. She's also the author of the novel Kiss the Sky. Um, Marisa Meltzer is the author of Girl Power, which was just released, or does it come out in May? No, it was released in uh, early. Oh, yeah, I was at the party. I, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I just you finished breastfeeding. That night. Yeah. That was a busy night. Um, Girl Power, the 90s revolution in music, and she's the co-author of How Sassy Changed My Life. Um, her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Slate, Elle, and Teen Vogue, and she attended Evergreen State College and currently lives in Brooklyn, New York, so she's always living in the really hip places. Um, <laughs> she is working on tons of things, including she, she, I learned today that she has the first chapter of a novel on her blog, Marissa, Marissa, Marissa. She writes about feminism for Slate, and she most recently wrote about um, Hall videos, H-A-U-L. Do, do people know this, that, that weird YouTube phenomenon where teenage girls blog about, or they do videos basically about what they've bought at the stores. Um, so she can talk about that. And she posts ephemera to, to melter.tumblr.com, feminist ephemera. And she's also working on a zine with Elizabeth Spiridakis called First Kiss, and it's an anthology of first kiss stories. So that's the incredible panel. And Amy Richards, my friend of 17 years and collaborator of 15 years probably, is going to vigorously moderate. Thank you. Um. And I'm just going to start by saying a little bit of how we came to this panel today was in part the, the anniversary edition of Manifesta coming out, in part the celebration of the Sackler Center third anniversary, and had this opportunity to sort of say, where is feminism today? What does it mean? And as much as we've evolved in our feminism and we keep sort of refining our definition, there are some staples that have sort of stayed with us. And some of those staples are people and ideas and the ideas that those people create. So when we had the opportunity to do it this, I had the opportunity to do this today, it was, I was like, you were all our first choice. <laughs> and you could all do it and you came, in part because you're all stellar in your own right, but you had such an impact on us and what you were doing. And specifically, when we were writing Manifesto, when we came up with the ideas of Manifesto in the mid-90s, as Jennifer said, we were sort of the, the pets of the second wave, which is code for also maybe we were just like a little too um, obedient and okay. idolizing of the second wave. Um, and Alex Kate Schulman was one of those people who was both somebody who inspired us, but also somebody who was sort of saying indirectly or directly, create your own feminism, go out and do it. If you want, if you don't see what you want to see, you have to write it yourself and you have to create it. And so you were inspiring us then with that message and, and continuing to inspire us today. And Fry at the time was a friend and a colleague and it was, as you know, Jennifer said, we were in the offices of Ms. Magazine and Gloria Steinem's office, and I think feeling like that was like the center of the universe. And, <laughs> and Gloria Jacobs and Jean Ann Panache are here, colleagues from those days at Ms. And Farai was at the time working at ABC News, and there was a little bit of a, I can't believe she's sold out. I can't believe she's at ABC. Why would you go to ABC and not work at Ms.? Or why would you do something? Why not work? Of course, ABC has long outlived most alternative publications. Um, but 
it was a wonderful lesson for us, and it really became, in some ways, the premise of Manifesto when we were asked to define feminism for our generation was how do you both sustain the vibrant alternative world that feminism has created and at the same time have a foot in the mainstream and try to shake up the mainstream. And for I was at that time leading by example and, and though it was initially threatening, <laughs> it, it turned out to be a great lesson and has obviously continued to inspire us in so many ways. And Marissa, less so at the time inspiring us, but everything she has gone on to chronicle, Sassy Magazine and the Riot Girl movement were, we wish your books had existed when we were writing Manifesta because we, there was too few resources available that chronicled those worlds and they were such a big part of what we were trying to say was feminism today and how it was just out there in the culture. And so the ideas that you've gone on to, to document so well um, were in Manifesta and so thank you for writing that. Uh, and I just want to start by saying that when Jennifer and I wrote Manifesto, we were a little bit sort of, I think, too dependent on how feminism was being defined by feminist institutions. And so we would sort of say, feminism is the movement for the full social, political, and economic equality of all people. And that's true, but once we started lecturing and got out in the world, we would get audiences of people that would say, uh-huh, and how does that relate to your life, and what do you mean by that, and how do you live a feminist life? And so we've had to kind of evolve on our definition, and when Jennifer was introducing us, you know, by introducing our backstory, it, it, it shows the context of how we were, in many ways, and I think this is true for most people born after 1970, feminist from birth, whether or not we were identifying that as the way to define our lives, we were so in, born into a world that had so radically changed by, as a result of feminism. And so we were the beneficiaries of that. And it was not until we were in college where we started using the actual language of feminism and saying, oh yeah, that's right. That's why my Barbie was having abortions. And that's why, that's why my mom made me sing that song. It was standing up for yourself and it was about power and it was about this movement. But it was not until I think we were in college where we had a language. And then it was not until after college where we had each other to sort of say, oh yeah, that's, that's it, that, we're not weird. Um, or at least we can be weird together. <laughs> um, and so I wanna start by asking each of our panelists where you were when you started to identify, where you were in your life when you started to identify as, as a feminist and to sort of go in, in chronology, Alex, if you don't mind answering first where you were. And, and I will just say to some of the panelists as well that the title for today's talk, as you know, is, is Red Stockings, Riot Girl, and Right Now. And though many of us, I think, know Red Stockings and Riot Girl, and hopefully right now, maybe not everybody does. So if your answer can maybe incorporate that to, to also fill that out for people. Alex. Uh, well, it's so different from your lives. Uh, when I, uh, I was very lucky, is this working? Is it? Okay. I was very lucky to be right here in New York when the uh, women's liberation movement was born and even luckier to be able to get in on the very beginning of it. I was a 30-something um, year old housewife, mother of two. I had had to, leave, well had to, um, I left my job as an encyclopedia editor when I got pregnant because there were no options at that time for childcare. Uh, and um, I felt as if my life was over. It, it was uh, not from then on, I was just going to be a housewife mother and uh, my ambitions in the world were finished. And then suddenly, <laughs> I heard on WBAI some women talking about this absolutely newborn women's liberation movement. Um, the ideas that they spouted were ideas that I had secretly longed for but never I articulated. And um, they gave the telephone number of a meeting and the address. So I went to my first meeting. This was before Red Stockings had even begun. This was in 1967. And uh, it was a life transforming meeting because there were all these women who were a decade younger than I, um, who not only didn't, well, I had been 
ex I had been used to being dismissed from the world as this mother. That was all. I was this housewife. It's hard, I'm sure, for people to imagine what the culture was like then. Um, and here was this group of women who not only didn't dismiss me, but they welcomed me because I was a living example, this housewife <laughs> mother, of everything that their theories were talking about. <laughs> and so um, instead of feeling thereafter that my life was over, I felt as if my life was just beginning. And indeed, it was. Fry, do you want to? And also, Fry, I know that you went to a, was it an all girls school mm -hmm. from K through 12? Mm -mm, just high school. Oh, just high school. Okay. Because I say, you know, it, it, being in an all women's college, which I was, it was definitely an experience where I had that turned back on me. And I remember my graduation ceremony and then being at my boyfriend's graduation ceremony a week later, where it was, and tomorrow he will go out and do this and he will go out and do that. And having never felt the invisibility until I had the visibility and wish I had had it so much younger in life. And so I guess you didn't get to high school either, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't ever remember not being a feminist because my mother very much mm -hmm. is, and she's a big influence. And my grandmother was as well um, in a very profound way where she also had to fight for her ability to be an independent woman. And my grandfather, in fact, was just very negative about the fact that she wanted to work. And she put herself through college after she'd had six kids. And so she's someone who just, you know, made it happen. And um, so I don't really remember a sort of coming into feminism moment, but I do know that because of um, who, who my mother is and who I am and, and just because my family was very embracing of experimentation, you know, I would get like a chemistry set you know, one year when I was a kid, and then I would get a doll, and then I would get an erector set, and then I would get, you know, a jewelry making kit and a basket weaving, you know, set up, and you know, all these things like being able to experiment with all these roles. And my sister loved Barbies, but what she really loved was mummifying them and burying them in the backyard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's somewhere out in the yard, there's all these mummified Barbies. Um, so, uh, you know, and I read a lot of comic books. Uh, Barbie's was... looking for a new career. I've seen the bus ads. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> Mummy. B Mummy Barbie. <laughs> um, but in high school, I started the debate club, and we would debate all boys' schools sometimes. Um, and that didn't seem weird to me. We had an academic decathlon team, of course, an all girls team because we were all girls. And that just seemed normal to me. Um, in college, I was part of an improv troupe that was actually very gender balanced, it was like 50-50 men and women, and it started my freshman year and I did it all the way to my senior year. Um, so things like that, I think the ability to experiment with roles in play and work, you know, um, is something that I've really gotten from my family legacy, which is one where women have had to constantly fight for agency. And there's many stories, including one where uh, <laughs> Not the most positive story, but uh, my grandmother's grandmother married a man who was much, much older and already had kids, and he was so jealous of her that he wouldn't let her go get the mail. You know, she'd had to walk down the path to get the mail, and if she walked down the path, she might see a man, blah, blah, blah. So she'd gone and gotten the mail one day, and he, you know, tried to raise a hand to her, and she had a pan full of hot lard, and she lifted it, and she was like, you want some of this, babes? You know, and he was just like, totally straight after that. You know? So it was just like... That was your influence. Yeah, it was just like, you know, in, in many ways, subtle and unsubtle, the women in my family have claimed their space. Um, you know, and I feel lucky that, that my time has been um, less confrontational in certain ways. And I want to say from the beginning that our definition of generation is maybe a little out of whack. <laughs> <laughs> There's not such a great range on the panel. And when Marissa got here, she said, I'm so excited to be the young one on the panel because I'm often with much younger people where they're like, what was it like in the 90s? So. <laughs> True. I do remember the 90s. Um, 
I came, I think I always identified as a feminist. I have a feminist mom who subscribed to Ms. and who took me to protests against the Ms. California pageant dressed as me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mom. Um, and uh, she worked at Planned Parenthood when I was uh, very young. So um, feminism was always a part of my life. And, and I also come from a very long line of divorces. So independent you know, women were also sort of ubiquitous in, in my family. Um, I think that, you know, I was always sort of weirdly gender essentialist. Like, I feel like growing up, I was always reminding everyone around me about the supremacy of being a girl. Like, I still, like, on almost a daily basis, feel sorry for men and feel, <laughs> you know, kind of like, God, it's not, I don't know. I've never, I never went through a phase of wanting to be a boy, and I always was extremely happy to be a girl and express that in many ways growing up to my family. Um, and so, I think, though, for me, that while I always identified as a feminist, I think that it really became personal in my life. Probably in like early high school, um, I happened to start high school in 1991, and that also happened to be around the same time that Riot Girl, which was the sort of underground uh, punk feminist movement, was coming. Uh, to fruition, and so, you know, for me, seeing pictures of girls with like um, halter tops and slut writ written across their stomach felt really different from my mother's feminism. My mom like only wears comfortable shoes and <laughs> keeps, keeps her Eileen stomach Fisher, covered. Yeah. <laughs> like wears, wears quite a bit of Eileen Fisher and, you know, Icelandic sweaters. Um, so so seeing, seeing that kind of glittery, girly, young feminism was extremely uh, visceral for me. And I thought, you know, I want that. And so that also was able to both be like a, a personal uh, feminism and also a, a nice way of my teenage rebel rebellion mm -hmm. kind of seeing itself through. Um, so. Well, your example is so refreshing because I know in my own example of coming to feminism, and I know this is true of many people of Alex's generation, you first had to try out other social justice movements because taking on gender felt too mediocre or too self-serving. I mean, I think there were different ways that people interpret it. But I need to sort of fight for civil rights in this country. And then it was through that where I was like, oh, wait, and women are left out. So it's actually very refreshing that you have been a gender essentialist and have <laughs> yeah. not seen yourself. So yeah, so I ended up having like a, a radio, my high school had America's largest high school radio station for some reason. Mm. And um, so I had like an all girl radio show oh. and um, I organized like a women's history celebration in my school because of course they had never had one. So um, yeah, it just kept kind of manifesting itself in my life. And yeah. now, you know, I write about it. Good. Well, on that question, I mean, on that <laughs> note, when Jennifer and I had to go back and update Manifesta, we were both a little nervous to read a book that was 10 years old and feared that so many of the examples in there were just going to fall flat and not be current anymore. And we were a, a little bit <laughs> sort of humiliated by how many times we mentioned Monica Lewinsky and Britney Spears. <laughs> and, and, and though comforted by 10 years past, we actually had to define who Monica Lewinsky was for this generation. And, you know, we're happy that the Spice Girls broke up, although now we have Posh Spice. I mean, I'm sort of like, she hasn't really evolved much in 10 years. And so there was the good and the bad. And, and I was, as I was personally reading it, I thought, did we actually really all know that at one point? Because now I can't, I mean, Jennifer can't remember she went to Marissa's book party. I'm like, I definitely, we couldn't write this book today. <laughs> um, but we end the, we had to write a new introduction um, where we um, got to apologize for some of the things we didn't do so well in, in the first round. But we end it by saying that how we have come to view feminism 10 years after writing Manifesta is to recognize our power to create social justice in our own unique ways. And we really wanted to put the emphasis on what we uniquely can contribute to this movement. And as Jennifer said, the Alice Rossi quote, there was so much attention to, well, when are you gonna do the big thing? When are you gonna do the massive thing? When are you gonna, and we were sort of focused on, well, when are you gonna do the little thing? Because it's all those little things knitted together or woven together that collectively add up to something. And also, 
we've learned, however many years it's been, hundreds of years in this country, that people are very ambivalent about power sharing with women. Power is defined in a very traditional way. And so we might make more success if we redefine what power is or reimagine power in a way that is less hierarchical. And when Jennifer and I talk to college students who feel eternally disempowered, we always say, but yeah, but you have access to, first of all, you know what the internet is and you know how to create a web log and you need to do all these things and, and identifying that for them and their sort of eyes light up. They're like, really, I have power in this movement? Mm -hmm. And we all do have something unique that we're contributing. And I'd like to ask all of our panelists to, to say what you think your, your power is or how does Jennifer's five-year-old say it? Your, your special What's ability? Your special ability is. Your special oh, ability. I love that. That is good. And I say it's also hard to ask this of women because women are always so humble and say, well, I'm not really. Um, so I hope you can, if, if that was your instinct, to step out of that and, and share your special ability with us. And, and why don't we go, Fry, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I think that at this point in time, like many people, my special ability is survival, um, <laughs> economic survival and cultural survival. And... Um, Right now, I'm starting a new business. Uh, I, 15 years ago, I started a, a blog called Pop and Politics. Um, I was 25 years old. I was just starting to do political commentary on TV for CNN. And um, my career as a pundit took off, and the blog took off. And it, in some ways, kind of overwhelmed me because I had no infrastructure to grow it. And I have, in many ways, over the years, as I've you know, I went through being a TV pundit, a network news correspondent, TV host at Oxygen during startup years, went into digital consulting, went into public radio. But pop and politics is something where I've always been running to chase this. Um, it was first a no-profit, an intentional no-profit with no advertising, and then a non-profit. And I, it's exhausted me, you know? And so basically, you know, I never took a salary. I raised a ton of money for it. And if I had it to do over, I would definitely take a salary because, you know, why not? Um, but at this point in time, you know, after sort of the, the show that I hosted for NPR was canceled during, you know, a wave of budget cuts that were painful but not personally directed at me, three shows died during the span of one year, which is quite a lot. Uh, News and Notes, Bryant Park Project, and Day to Day were all canceled in one year. I was offered different jobs and I just didn't want them. And at first I was sort of like, why am I not taking these jobs, you know? And then I realized I wanna be an entrepreneur and I already am. And so I'm raising, um, I would use the F word, the, an F load of money um, to, <laughs> like, to, start, to start, <laughs> an F load of money to start a dual bottom line media company, meaning with a for-profit wing and a non-profit wing. And I'm taking it very seriously. And I have been hustling and doing consulting and doing all these things that are not journalism in order to learn how to be a businesswoman. And I'm getting really pretty close to doing what I need to do. And that's just, that's a huge journey for me because I miss being a journalist. Um, I miss covering the news, but right now I need to build infrastructure for media that's inclusive and diverse and where you can tell the truth. Great. Alex, do you? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking if anybody wants to make an investment, you can give information later. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so wonderful to be here on a panel with one, two, three, four women who grew up as feminists. It's so amazing to me. Um, and uh, I feel now at 77, well, almost 78, that um, my power has to do with looking back, um, that the writing I do can incorporate decades of this possibility that has come to pass, mm -hmm. where all of these women and generations are born able to assert their power, become entrepreneurs, um, organize. It's just the most wonderful thing. Uh, so in answering your question, I think I, I want to speak about 40 years ago when we women had virtually no power. 
we couldn't have done that. There were, of course, the occasional exceptions who were very annoying because they said, well, I could do it, why can't you? Uh, but for the most part, women didn't have power then. Um, and what was so wonderful about the birth of this feminist movement, and particularly red stockings, um, was that when you walked out your door in the morning, everything remained to be done. You couldn't take a step that dis didn't provoke you to want to make change. The power that we had then was being able to see everything as connected. Um, people now have many different projects, all I'm talking about feminism. There is such a huge array, and that's the most wonderful thing. But uh, the fact is that when we had nothing and had as a future everything to change, not one thing to change or a dozen things to change, but everything to change the consciousness of an entire society, actually world, because it became a global movement, um, that was the most empowering thing I can ever experience, to be able to think it's up to you, change the world. And uh, so I'm just very grateful, again, that I was born when I was into a movement that was just beginning. I think there was, just to add, and I, I wasn't there in 1967, but I think there was some power in being an outsider that we've sort of lost today yeah. because mm -hmm. it was new and nuanced and so that even though it felt so disempowering, there was a power that came from that disempowerment. And similarly, what we hear, and I'm sure many of us in this room hear it, but when Jennifer and I are on campuses, it's not that people don't believe in the values of feminism, but they're sort of like, yeah, but what do you want me to do? What right. is it? Because they, when they, they take many steps before they see it and then need somebody to point out to them, oh, but did you think about this? Why are all the tenured, why are 80% of the tenured faculty male and 20% female? But they don't see that because they see the entire faculty looking more diverse. So I think mm -hmm. there's also the power in being able to have it so exposed to you exactly. what, what was wrong or the, the non-power sharing that existed. What's your special ability? <laughs> um, it's, I think it's a bit ironic being the youngest person on the panel and saying this, but I think it's my, I think it's nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I have a yeah. seemingly um, uh, unlimited capacity mm -hmm. for nostalgia, but I think that I've done a good job of being productive with it. And I think that, you know, I hope that other people will take a cue and, you know, things like, the Spice Girls or uh, Alanis Morissette or Riot Girl, you know, those things all do need to be written into mm -hmm. history. And I think so much of that is um, up to us to do. And I also, you know, I've always uh, been able to reconcile my uh, voracious consuming of pop culture by trying to parse it out and to write about it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that, that, uh, that's a powerful thing. It's it's all too easy to, you know, to be drawn to culture and to feel like um, you should be doing political organizing or, or something like that. But I think the more that we see feminism in our culture in a really superficial mm -hmm. way, you know, you see where culture needs to change along with politics. You know, if you, you I think, I look at somebody like Sarah Palin, which is like, <laughs> the rhetoric of feminism without without any of the substance mm -hmm. and you know to me that's that's where culture needs to change we can't just elect a woman mm -hmm. you know that's not enough <laughs> um, so <laughs> so uh, but yeah and I, I think it's it's nostalgia and feeling okay about that nostalgia and acting on it and mm -hmm. and writing your own history and not waiting for other people to do it the way that you guys did with manifesto was incredibly inspiring to me 
Well, I think what you're saying, too, is it's not nostalgia for the point of living in the past. It's nostalgia to the point of... Although I do of, like to live in the past. How do we move in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> but you like living in the near past. You're not like a Victorianist. You're like a riot yeah. girlist. You know? I went through a really intense Victorian phase as a child, though. I really honestly did. I subscribed to Victoriana magazine. Wow. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's so embarrassing. Um, but, you but, know, yeah. true <laughs> secrets of the feminists. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a study years ago, and I was reading the study because I was helping Gloria Sonnen with her book, Revolution From Within, that said that the more education women had, the lower their self-esteem. And it's because they were less likely to see themselves included in the text. The sort of, the, the higher you got up that, that chain, the less likely women's stories and examples were to be there. And I see that when we travel to high schools and colleges still that women's history and non-white people's history and is still so it, it really is in the margins or it's sort of the you know the class that not everybody has to take and you actually have to do it on top of your regular course load and it still has not done a good job of being inserted into the curriculum which is why some people might say to the feminine, the Sackler Center for Feminist Art, but why do you really need to put that there? You, you need to because it's not yet completely in the rest of history. The, you just were alluding to this a little bit, both Alex and Marissa in your answers, the sort of generations and how we can sometimes be too dependent on feminism in another generation and conversely maybe too dismissive of how ideas that were put into place years ago have manifested maybe not in the way that we always wanted them to. The writing the slut across your belly is maybe for somebody, oh, why are they doing that? But the and and it's fun for me to be in a on a panel that's labeled generational, essentially generational feminism, and not have it be so tense. Because a lot of times when we talk about intergenerational feminism, we're more often talking about the negative aspects of that and how it's manifesting negatively. And I interpret that in, as two sources to that problem. One, I think that young people are sometimes scared about either sounding dismissive or scared about taking on that, that power and that responsibility, and that's intimidating. And conversely, I think it's very threatening for some older women to have younger women and younger men expressing feminism in ways that they weren't able to, and that feels intimidating. And, and, and also makes them feel vulnerable. And so I don't know, um, I mean, Alex, you, you represent more clearly one generation on the panel, but I don't want you to feel like you have to exclusively oh, no, talk I'm about that. I'm happy to. That's but why do you think, from, from an old, and your, your book is, your new book is sort of going in that direction, but why do you think young, older women have a hard time appreciating the contribution that younger women are making, uh, or seeing You've even. got me. I have no idea. I appreciate the contribution of younger women so much. I mean, to me, it's like the fulfillment of a lifetime mm -hmm. of, of effort to, that we actually, what we did all those decades ago, bore fruit. And I'm grateful for every single manifestation of younger <laughs> women's feminism. I mean, it thrills me. Uh, so you're asking the wrong person. And it really irritates me no end to hear feminists of my generation grumbling that the younger women aren't the way we were. Well, thank God they're not the way we were. I mean, life goes on. You're doing fabulous work. Um, it is depressing also to note that on the campuses, the uh, work of women isn't integrated. And you know, I mean, all the things that are still left to be done, which is, I suppose, in a sense, still everything in one mode or another. Um, that's depressing, but you know, that's not, What's wrong isn't the fault of young or old feminists, it's the fault of the other people who aren't mm -hmm. feminists. <laughs> right. And Fry, I'm sure, because I think we've been in these same rooms together, where we'll be in a room sort of straddling those generations and trying to be in some ways the translator. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that role of translating between the generations, what, what are you personally offering? Well, you know, I, I'm starting a new book about uh, millennial generation politics, and 
you know, people define millennial in different ways, but um, sort of at the lowest end people usually use, it's around 18 and the highest end is like 33. And some people define it different ways. But um, I got contacted by um, an organization, uh, not a women's organization, to be on a sort of youth panel. I'm like, I'm 40 years old. I am writing about millennials, and if you want me to be on this panel, I'll talk about my work. But there's, because I started doing media, I started doing television when I was 25. I think some people still think I'm 25. And I think that the best thing, and you know, you got, we have all talked about yeah. it, the most important thing you can do is stop pretending to be what people need you to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody needs you to be the young person, be clear that you're not the young person if you're not that person. And know who those people are, have people you can recommend. So I was like, I'm happy to be on this panel as a researcher or you know, to recommend some other people to you. And don't, you know, don't get overly invested in your own relevance. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's important. Lucy, do you have anything to add? As the young person <laughs> As on the, the young panel? person. <laughs> um, you know, I think that sometimes the, the there, sometimes there's a language barrier or the talking points are different. And I think that, you know, I... Did you have somebody from another, gen I mean, from a generation, an older generation talk to you about your books and... Um, Say, I learned something, thank you for adding clarity. I wasn't sure why people like sassy in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think that people are, people are always pleasantly surprising me that are older with their curiosity mm -hmm. for it and their interest. You know, even my mom showed up to my reading with slut written across her stomach, under her shirt, but still, <laughs> that was her. She was trying to bridge the gap for me and show her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> show her support. Some moms bake cookies. That's yeah. that's not Allison. And you wore an Icelandic yeah. sweater. And you're comfortable. <laughs> no, I actually, I actually wore something that she told me she thought was too racy. Okay. For the, uh, <laughs> showed some bra, but uh, anyway. Uh, but I, I think that you know now there's I see some of the um, the generational like pull and push when I look at some of the discourse online. And, you know, I think that we were talking about this before the panel, but that so much of maybe, you know, the fourth wave, whenever that is coming, whoever that will be, will definitely have something to do with the internet, surely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see it on like listservs that, I on, that I'm on where I feel like there's a older feminists who are sometimes shocked or um, bewildered by the actions mm -hmm. and rhetoric of younger feminists, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, like, the way that they use their internet, the internet and the way that they lead their lives, which is certainly not specifically a feminist problem. It seems to be a real generational problem. But I think that, you know, trying to sort of bridge those divides is, is going to be a challenge for us. And, and I think it's a really important one. You know, I want older feminists to harness the power of the internet and I want younger feminists to be able to explain why, why they're taking pictures of themselves, you know, with their friends or why they're, you know, blogging about their abortions. Mm -hmm. When Jennifer and I wrote Manifesto, we practically put the internet in quotes. <laughs> like, it's probably not going to be around that long. <laughs> uh, Early days. Yeah. I, I want to um, say one thing that uh, what Marissa said reminded me of, and that is, it, there is this, it, when you said about your mom uh, kind of disapproving that you had some bra showing, mm -hmm. well, uh, Somehow, the parents' generation is always uh, mm -hmm. assumed to be sexless and <laughs> prudish. But I just want to remind you that the feminists of the second wave were the ones who didn't even wear any bras and let our breasts flop around um, <laughs> on purpose. And we... we uh, demanded abortion rights, we demand, which brought out into the public discourse talk about mm -hmm. sex. We wanted sex, 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 sex. Mm -hmm. Now there were some feminists of my generation who were against pornography and who were kind of pur puritanical, but there was a tremendous number of us who objected to that and who wanted to have talk about sex, and uh, equal sex. We wanted to be able to go and get sex whenever we wanted. We <laughs> wanted to do away with the double standard. Um, we wanted to be able to 
talk about and use birth control. So I'm just wanting to say that just because we're of a parental generation doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we are or ever were puritanical. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The, I'm just going to ask one more question of our panel, and then we'd love to hear from everybody in the audience or people that want to speak up. But the, one of the most successful chapters in this book is called The Dinner Party. And we were inspired to write that chapter in part because of Judy Chicago's wonderful piece and her ability in that piece to bring together women in history, as we were talking, who otherwise don't get to come together in history books the way men do. There's not that story being told. There, It has to be an alternative story. And we also were inspired to write the dinner party chapter. Had the Sackler Center only been around then, we could have been even more inspired. We were inspired to write it because so for so many people, feminism seemed to be this extracurricular pursuit. It was something you did at a now meeting or when you read Ms. Magazine or something at the Y and, or a lecture like this. And then it left people confused when they left those meetings and those designated feminist spaces of how to practice feminism in their everyday lives in more mundane ways. And so the dinner party was meant to inspire people by bringing people together and documenting something that we had done which is to have dinner parties over years of, and using them as an excuse to just meet women that we wanted to meet and bring them together and to have conversations about fear and what we're scared of and what we're nervous about and doing that in a, in a relatively safe setting. And so being inspired by being so close to the dinner party, what, what are the ways in all of your lives that you more mundanely practice feminism? When you walk out the door and it's not so obvious, what are the ways that you do, besides wearing your comfortable shoes or writing slut across your belly, um, that make you, what are the feminist decisions you make? I'm like, you don't have to go first. I mean, and I'll just say for myself, I mean, besides yeah, sort of strategically do doing these dinner parties, you know, I have, you know, I have little kids and little kids give you this like mm -hmm. many great moments where the neighborhood girl will come over and she'll say, well, I'm going to be the cheerleader because I'm a girl, so I'm not going to play basketball. And I'm like, and not only do I say, girls can play basketball players, I get out the book and I say, look, here's the New York Liberty. Look, there are girls playing and they're professional and they get paid. And so there's things that I do like that. Mm -hmm. And then there are other deliberate things that I do, and I can downright be, I mean, you used the F word and the B word, where if I just feel like I have shuttled the kids back and forth to school one too many times, I will just say to Peter, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it today. And when my kids were little and they would cry, mommy, mommy, and still today, I won't go. Because not only do I want them to not be overly dependent on me as the caregiver, but I don't want them to not see their father in that role as the caregiver. And so a lot of what I do is, is not do stuff and not like have that. things expected of me. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, listening to Amy, I, re I relate to that a lot. And one of the things I think, the most important thing I think I do now is just when people younger, people are, they're usually younger than me, mm -hmm. but if anyone reaches out to me via email or calls or meets me somewhere and asks for something, if I can provide it, I do. Mm -hmm. And I always follow up because it's such a small thing, but it may, I, I know that when I first moved to New York, the fact that I could call you or I made these, that they made these alliances with feminists that were in, inspiring to me or just made me feel less alone, um, made all the difference in terms of me feeling like I was powerful and could make change. Alex, you wanna? Yeah, um, can I use my time to tell a story about Judy Chicago and the dinner party? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, well, one of the early things I did as a feminist when I became a feminist was I decided to stop giving couples dinner parties for my husband and his, um, his business associates. <laughs> and I said, no more. And I, for about, I don't know, six or so years, I did not have a single dinner party. Uh, everything was couples then, before uh, the movement entered my life. And then Judy Chicago was coming to town to present the dinner party. It was its first opening, and I broke my rule and I had a dinner party for Judy, and uh, there were 10 of us, because my table could seat 10. And she was a friend of mine, 
Well, in those days, all of us knew each other. I mean, in the very beginning, the movement was so small that we all just made all these connections together. So uh, Judy and nine others, uh, no, Judy and eight others and I all sat down to this table together. And it was a huge change in my life again because it meant I was now free to have dinner mm -hmm. parties whenever I wanted, just with my women friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I just think that um, right now, one of the things that, that I do that you know goes back to the translation role is that I think that there's a lot of um, intersectional drama between you know people of different races, people of different um, you know genders, people of different sexual orientations, and I'm to the extent that I can, I'm trying to observe and inspire dialogue. And that's really what the, the next book I'm working on is. And I think that that is something feminist where you can, you can observe um, you know, how people act and not, co not constantly react in a negative way to other people's negativity. Um, I got into an argument with a cab driver last night and I was disappointed in myself because it's like, it was so avoidable. I mean, he was, he was, he was, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, he was just going to be an annoying guy and, and there was no point in me mm -hmm. going there. But I see right now a lot of times when, um, you know, I, I think of Proposition 8, I was living in California during Proposition mm -hmm. 8 and it was just a disaster. I mean, it was just such a disaster. I was at this this thing called uh, the ballot brunch where um, a friend of mine hosts this brunch before any election where there are ballot initiatives and everyone has to study the ballot initiatives and present recommendations. And so as we were discussing Proposition 8, um, it was two white gay men and I think three heterosexual women including me and I was the only black woman. It was like a small little cluster of us. And, and we were all like, yeah, Prop 8 is going to pass, in part because there's been no coalition building. Um, people who are against Prop 8 have not been trying to really market to communities of color. We just saw the train wreck happening. And then it happened. And people are still mad at it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that one thing that needs to happen, you know, it's just like is, is some traffic copping of different agendas based on people's identity. Because I think you know, the good thing is that you can be whoever you want, but the bad thing is if you don't communicate, then you can cancel out each other's mm -hmm. ability to make social change. And I think that right now things are just too, too serious for mm -hmm. us to be for no reason across different identity-based lines. And so we need, to, we need to pull it together. And so right now I'm watching and, and then I hope to play a constructive role <laughs> at some point. Um, I, I have a fair amount of teenage friends yeah. for somebody my age, um, whether they're like friends from the internet or whatever, and I take a great amount of pride in trying to like curate the cultural mm -hmm. and uh, political choices in their lives because yeah. they're young and so impressionable. And yeah. so, you know, I do like to send them manifesta and <laughs> old copies of Sassy and everything that, you know, Winona Ryder movies and everything that shaped me so much when I was yeah. a teenager. But I also really love tell like having hearing about their love lives or like things that annoy them at school and, and trying to plant as many, you know, feminist seeds, encouraging to call themselves feminist. Um, one friend like read my book and then tried to get a feminist club started at her school the next day, which was um, so amazing to me. Her principal said no, but that's a whole <laughs> other story. Um, and then I also think, you know, especially amongst writers in New York who are women, there's so much competition, and mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of, um, uh, I think the first instinct is often to see one woman do well and to think that there's no um, opportunity for you or something, mm -hmm. and I really make an effort in my life to have like a network of female writer friends and that, that are very, you know, real relationships and to help each other and to be genuinely proud of each other and, you know, to realize that one person's success is not going to take away from yours, just hopefully as an example that that will catch on because that's something that um, 
bums me out to mm -hmm. no end that you see again and again women picking on women in the media, so. You know, the movie thing, I just had dinner with a friend and she got a Netflix subscription for three high school women that she's friends with and sends them movies and then she, and then they can send her movies. And I was like, that's such that's a great brilliant. way to communicate. Yeah. It's mm. like a modern day version yeah. of a book club, but uh -huh. Definitely. even easier. Um, so now we'd love to hear from the audience. There are microphones on either side. If you mm. are feeling lazy or you're feeling too trapped, we can just repeat your question. Mike. Hi, something came up I'm really interested because it's an intergenerational group of women about, um, Alex brought it out with uh, puritanical view uh, and sexuality and pornography. Um, and I was informed my analysis of pornography came from Dworkin and um, uh, Susan Griffin's Pornography in Silence. So I just didn't, I was wondering about having it stay in the air that the analysis of being concerned about how women are portrayed in pornography is not um, uh, coming under the rubric of puritanical, and I was wondering to see what people would say about that. Well, I, I, the, the first thing it just makes me think of is how, um, how, how much that conversation, or the, the, the seemingly co competing tensions in that mm -hmm. formulation is do we care about the fact that there's violence against women, and then does that, does dealing with that anxiety or, or dealing with eradicating that injustice, do we have to give up freedom, certain freedoms in order to do so? And that's been the, the conflict the whole time, and I think the way it's being re, um, it, the, the really painful debate that's going on right now is about sex work versus sex trafficking mm -hmm. and people talking about sex can be work that a woman chooses and she should be able should be legalized and decriminalized and there should be all these ways to to have it be a form of expression and and way of making money versus no we have to absolutely eradicate it because the the potential for abuse has been just proven over and over to be kind of overwhelming. That's where we're at right now. And so I think, it's, I think the conversation has changed a little bit from being about pornography, and I know that that was an unbelievably painful split and debate um, in the 80s uh, for activists. And I think we're seeing it again right now with people who are working around sex work versus sex trafficking. I think people thought by changing the language to being about sex trafficking, it would get them out of that debate and sort of that um, in what seemed like an intractable place, but it's right back where it was. And I think it is, and I think it's really hard. I mean, I, and, and to Farai's point about kind of, you know, being the traffic director is, you know, there are a lot of otherwise allies out there who aren't able to come together, and the consequence is going to be that everybody loses. Um, and, and yet I understand why they can't come together because they only see the other person's position as a total, utter compromise. And not something they can support. And I mean, there are wonderful groups out there. And, and actually, you did a wonderful panel at Sackler about a year ago on sex trafficking. Um, you know, but Dorchen Leithold, who's at Sanctuary for Families, has done a lot on this issue. And Equality Now has done a lot. There's a, other sort of more localized group. There's a great film out now called The Playground Project. And it's about sex trafficking um, in, within the borders of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such a arresting film because it's very, it's, it's, we're more sympathetic when we see um, the Southeast Asian young girl, woman, we're not quite sure, than it is to see the white 16-year-old from Kansas. And we're like, wait, you chose that? You didn't choose that? Where's the... So it calls into... So there's a lot out there right now. And there was that movie Trade that was a more popular. So there's a lot out there. And hopefully, that by having those cultural moments and things to hold on to, we can set them to our our 16-year-old friends on Netflix, um, we can have more of these conversations and try to get past the intractable place. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, as far as pornography goes, um, I think that, it, it, you know, pornography and so many other things that are, are related to sex acts and how we view them really have to do with agency. And to me, that's always mm -hmm. the standard. It's like, does a woman have agency? because I have friends who are in the fetish community and their form of agency involves doing things that other people would consider humiliating, painful, you know, oppressive, but it is a form of their sexual expression. And although I don't choose the same expression, I appreciate that it is 
for them, it's their choice, you know? And so I think all of us have different reasons that we do different things. Um, but I think at the same time, ultimately, when I think about, when I think about the conversation, um, I think about agency. Do you have agency in this decision? And also, is it an informed consent? You know, because you can consent to things verbally um, or even on paper, and it's not informed consent. So I think to me, when you think about issues like pornography, um, sex work, um, anything controversial, I, I always think, what, what's the level of informed consent? What's the level of agency of the players involved? Um, hi, thanks. This is an amazing panel, and it was amazing to hear. I love hearing about the different milieu over decades. Like, Alex, your stories about going to the meeting and then having the dinner party are so wonderful. And then, of course, Marissa and I pretty much share a milieu where the same age and came up through most of the same um, cultural forces. And what I'm interested in that was harder to get at in this panel because Marissa is the young one, is the right now <laughs> aspect of mm -hmm. the title, right? And that's something that I think probably um, Amy and Jennifer and Marissa especially would be really um, well equipped to talk about because of either your um, speaking tours or Marissa, your extensive online networks. Um, what, you know, uh, we know that the num like, compared even with like my and Marissa's generation, the number of young women calling themselves feminists continues to drop, right? Although I talk with my friends who teach It's in actually statistically it's up. Gross. It's up? It's really? up. It's, and it's always been up, and younger people are more likely, the age range of 18 to 24, are more likely to identify as feminists than but, any other age group. And more likely now than the same age group 10, 20 10, years 20 ago? 10, 20 years ago. Okay, so already, it's just, There's many more people now who, I mean, it's also too that they ask the question, I think, of men and women now, and they used to only ask it of women. Uh -huh. So that's some of it, although I think that's probably not a huge percentage. But um, I guess my question is just precisely about that, like what's going on feminist-wise with like the actual youngest mm -hmm. people, with people who are in high school and college and around that age now? And how is the internet affecting that? Um, great. That's yeah, it, that's, that's my question. question. Um, well, it's interesting, too, with the whole concept of right now, because, of course, we're, we're all still living, so we're part of right now. <laughs> Everyone in this room is part of right now. But it's true that it does, you do sort of think, like, what about the kids who were born in 1995? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things they're doing that's really important is around abortion rights, reproductive justice in general, so pregnancy decisions and supporting um, all, all, all decisions. And one thing that I'm particularly excited about lately is are projects like the doula project. So these are women who are trained to be, to attend births, but they also attend abortions and they also attend adoptions. So they are supporting, they think that every pregnancy decision deserves support. To me, that's like a really important, exciting feminist thing that younger people are pioneering. And Amy and I, when we do abortion related, um, like screenings of that and abortion film and do discussions specifically around abortion, we have been seeing tons of younger women and men come in who are from the birth community, really trying to, to make that link between abortion and birth, all of those pregnancy decisions as being crucial and, and truly linked. Um, and then similar to that, um, a much broader or more complicated, more nuanced understanding of what, it, of, of what abortion, having a baby or, or raising kids might, or placing a child in adoption, of what those decisions might mean in an individual's life, and a lot more respect for how diverse and how everybody's circumstances are gonna dictate what that experience is, and not, really not using words like pro-choice or pro-life very much, um, or saying things like, I am a feminist, but I am also pro-life, and then going on to define what that means. And it's typically not, and I bomb abortion clinics, it's usually like, and I believe that it is a life, and it's taking a life, and here's how I practice my feminism to support that value system without taking away another woman's opportunity to make decisions, meaningful decisions about her life. Uh, I think trans issues mm -hmm. will be really prominent in you know, future uh, feminist discourse, the fourth wave, whatever, you know, it's however it's going to play out. Um, I think that, you know, we've already seen some bits of how it's impacting, like, um, uh, all female colleges. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in the way that when I was in high school, there were starting to be 
it was becoming more common maybe for you know uh, teenagers to come out and for gay straight alliances mm -hmm. on high school campuses I think we're going to start seeing how um, you know trans populations will will sort of change and get younger and mm -hmm. in high schools I, I think that that's something that will affect feminism for the next generation a lot I, I just think, it, you know I mean I, I won't go into too much detail, but you know, a friend of a friend, um, there's a, you know, basically a 10 year old girl who is already you know, living as a boy and very firm in her gender, gender identity. And I think that one of the things that that, that raises is just questions for parents. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not a parent, you two are parents. And, and I just think of like, you know, how parents now, I mean, that, that's a lot to process you know, how you choose to, you know, when your child has a gender identity that other people may not support, how, how do you as a parent navigate that? I mean, it's nothing profound that I'm saying here, but it just strikes me that that's, that's a big burden. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, you wanna have, luckily she does have feminist parents, both her father and mother, um, but, um, but it's, it's just, you know, one of those, modern challenges that I think, um, you know, I, I think about like in an intergenerational sense, you know, every generation of parents also has to think about how they do and don't critique the behavior of the children they're raising. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's not easy answers, you know, yeah. to, to how you try to guide a child who's experiences are very different from yours, you know? And, and I do think, though, that gender fluidity just in general is mm -hmm. much more, I mean, we, certain, we certainly see the moments when it's not allowed and it's prohibited, but it's much more acceptable. And you even see it, like, in snowboarding. I mean, I hate that now the Olympics is, you know, you have the female heat and the male, because when snowboarding emerged as a sport, it was, yeah. it, you couldn't tell the gender of the person. It was a sport that was just out there and available, and... And I think young people grew up watching that. And, you know, I will see, you know, kids that put on tutus one day and then they put the tutu on and they push the dump truck, you know? And I think that you just see that from a, a young age and you see people being okay with that. I think what they're okay with is when both things are happening. I think it's harder sometimes when there's that sense of transitioning or abandoning. And you see it among sexuality too. Early on, you can already hear kids being like, is that, is that your girlfriend? Is that your boyfriend? And, and <laughs> even, even though there's definitely still danger and, and discomfort with same-sex relationships, it's much more likely that kids see that as, as, as something open to them. The other thing that I see with a lot of younger people is and this is Jennifer and I host, a, we're, it's feminist summer camp in New York City, but we hosted feminist winter term, mm -hmm. where we bring students from all different colleges, is more and more what I was sort of crediting Fry with all those years ago, is people sort of, I'm a women's studies major, and I'm a philosophy major, and I'm an art major, mm -hmm. and, and bringing their feminist politics to these other disciplines, and starting from a really young age, and, and being an artist, but then within the context of that, trying to explore what it means to be a female artist and how to be a feminist. And, and picking up on that at a very young age, you said a, a young woman was unsuccessful in starting her feminist club in high school, but we see tons of young people that are starting mm -hmm. feminist clubs in high schools, and they're often around things having to do with Women's History Month, or we want to do AIDS Awareness Day, or we want to celebrate national, you know, coming out day, they're often linked to some sort of theme. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing we're seeing, which is I think more common, we host this, we go to this program every year that Barnard College does, and this 40 or 50 students are just stellar, and they've already raised like $40,000 for cancer research, and they've already painted a children's wing of a hospital. But they're just starting to have that moment, and these are high school juniors and seniors of, well, that's great that we raised $40,000 for cancer, but what about women cancer specifically? And what you can see the light bulbs starting to go off. They have the instincts toward social justice, but not yet the gender awareness around, around it, and they're starting to get that. I promise this will be next. And then. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so much of what you said has been um, very thought-provoking and uh, has brought up a couple of interesting points. Uh, one was, uh, Amy, the question that you asked about competition among women. Um, I find that one trick that I have used, and it, it's not a trick, it's truly heartfelt, is to compliment my students who, uh, how do you say, outgrow me. 
if they have done something exceptional that I myself have not done or even thought of, I do say thank you so very much. I'm so glad that I was a part of that process. Uh, and I do expect you to excel me in many ways. And I'm so very grateful to have been a part of you moving forward in ways that I will not. So, but, you know, I guess in, that brought up to me that I too was brought up in a culture of men competing yeah. as opposed to completing. And it's for me to change that, that women who do outgrow me in certain ways are complimenting my contribution. Do you find that when you take the risk of saying that, that then somebody says, oh, and thank you, you get more information? Not that you're fishing for it, but do you get it? Well, I don't get it verbally, but I see them relax and light up, mm -hmm. and I see them so very grateful that I can take a back seat, even though I look like I'm in the front seat. I'm not. I'm in the front seat of what I've already accomplished, but I'm in the back seat of what they are yet to accomplish. And their whole attitude lights up. And that to me is their thank you. Not like verbally, they're able to even put it into words. They're so happy I've said it. Uh, my question, uh, because I've been dealing with this very uh, harshly lately, is that uh, I came from a background of art and healing and spirituality where, uh, not, Im not to be immodest, but I was um, how do you say, thought of an, an exceptionally lovely woman. Lovely and funny and spiritual and kind. And yet, those things were often, how do you say, connected with weakness. I haven't changed completely, those things are still there. But I certainly have become more, how do you say, assertive and uh, clearer and um, I don't take crap when it's put out at me in a, a rather obvious manner. And I yet still am around a lot of women who are not equal to the men in power, money, and prestige that they are working with. And I find myself, of course, needless to say, having to move on. But now that I'm in a position of having uh, shifted my identity into one that is uh, perhaps stronger, uh, a lot of attention is often viewed uh, toward me of, well, am I, or I'm, uh, am I on my way to being a dyke or a transsexual or uh, otherwise generally much more obnoxious than I used to be? Um, so I guess, this is something that all of us have to deal with, this level of seriousness and dignity and strength. And how is it still that we are wonderful and lovely and spiritual and all of these other things that we value oh so very much? So I guess I, I'd like to hear how you perceive, the, you, you know, the panel perceive that struggle inside themselves. And how do you handle the kind of um, stuff that comes at you when you're not quite viewed in such a wonderful manner, yet you know you're, you better be a little stronger because it's not weakness, and those other things are not obnoxious. So that's, that's the question. <laughs> Probably do you. Well, it's, what came to mind for me is just the, you know, the good cop, bad cop of jobs, which are, I think gender is, is you know, comes into the workplace all the time, but there's also um, many different people who play many different roles. But what you have to be willing to give up when you don't play the good cop role all the time is approval. And, you know, that's a classic feminist dilemma, is like, how much can you stand other people to disapprove of your behavior, even if that behavior is appropriate? Um, and that's, that's, a, that's an internal struggle that is part of the external struggle, and it's still, I think, one of the biggest things that women have to face is how much disapproval are we willing to take even if we think we're right, you know? That's good. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a question of um, integration, um, integrating the various parts of yourself, and that is one of the basic psychological questions facing everybody always. Mm -hmm. 
so in a sense, it's not exactly a gender question. It's, it's a question of being, maybe it's a question of confidence. I have a feeling that being able to integrate all of your different impulses and accept them, even though they may be at war with each other, is a matter of strength and confidence so that the, the more you can um, join with other people and make the world such that you get your strength, I know this is a big order, but, and it isn't a personal answer, but I do think that as um, a movement is successful, there is much less conflict that's going to keep tearing you apart. I think, uh, well, I would just add that, you know, weren't you in a radical feminist group called No More Nice Girls? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. Uh, and I want to be an honorary member. <laughs> Join. Yes, and, and No More Nice Girls went on for many, many years, and we could none of us have done the rebellious work that we did alone. We had to do it together. That's really what I'm trying to say about movement. I just, the well, one thing I would add is I think it's important to keep remembering it as a a societal problem and yes. it's not about you and it's uh, I try to remind myself that you know you really can't help but be a product of the culture that you come mm -hmm. from and you know those debates are, are going to exist but you know the way that they're really not going to be solved internally or you know in individual lives there's something that we have to fight for on a, on a greater level and fix the underlying issues yeah I think we have time for these two more questions. Melissa. Hi. You know, when you were talking about how there's not a lot of tension on the panel, and I've been to so many of these kind of intergenerational things that have been so like rife with tension, and as a person who worked in institutions of the second wave, and I feel like as a person now I'm over 40, I'm almost like a tween. I'm between this kind of like, I'm not a second generation person. Mm -hmm. I kind of fit into the third, but I'm really not. So in general, I always feel like I'm stuck. And I grew up, you know, loving all the whole second wave stuff and that totally taught me, but I'm a person who's like, so fixated on culture, and I write about Hollywood, Marissa, you're awesome. And, um, and I feel like now, you know, 10 years after I've kind of like left institutions, even though I've kind of dabbled in it back and forth, I feel like once I discovered how to mesh my feminism with my kind of pop culture freakness, then I understood my contribution to feminism mm -hmm. because I couldn't do the whole institutional stuff anymore, I just couldn't do it. I was exhausted by people who were like 20 years older than me who had so much energy and I was just like, I gotta take a nap. <laughs> so I just wanted to acknowledge kind of like figuring out your little bit and that's okay and how mm -hmm. all our little bits are what makes it interesting and makes it and redefines feminism and now that I'm writing about Hollywood and stuff the most interesting people are the high school students and the men who want to write about feminism in Hollywood and they're like why didn't a woman win an Oscar for you know 82 years and I'm like because blah 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 blah, blah. and they're like oh you know and it's not like me defining it but it's it's empowering people to ask the questions mm -hmm. so I don't know if I actually have a question but the point I'm trying to get you guys to illuminate is kind of how the different pieces like sports has come into the fore right now in terms of redefining feminism and pop culture and music and things like that in ways that weren't necessarily acceptable earlier because it was always about kind of like dire important emergency issues which are still vital now but it's kind of broadening the scope of feminism so if you guys can talk about that. Well, I think. So that I feel like there, there's this, just this idea that we don't just, we're not just simply political creatures. We're not bifurcated that way. And we exist in culture and we're interested in TV and in the world around us. And we are also interested in, in politics and the ways in which power is constructed and works. And we actually don't have to choose. And I think that that is what 
the daughters and sons of second wave feminism have been able to express a little bit more or spread that news a little bit more or have jobs in culture where you're, you know, you're, you're the head writer, you're Tina Fey and you're the head writer of Saturday Night Live or you mm -hmm. create this incredible um, TV show that really expresses third wave feminism because we grew up with a lot of things having already been changed. And, it, and there are moments when it is a little bit less mm -hmm. dire. And it's really important to, to attack the culture too, not only because we need to see visions of ourselves, as Amy was saying, all over the, the canon, all over the culture, but also because we need to keep archiving the work that women are doing. There's, mm -hmm. whenever, you know, that's why it's so crucial that the, feminist, uh, that the dinner party was finally given a permanent home. Work that women do, whether it's in you know songwriting or or creating um, an installation or writing books, tends to go away. And I mean, it's important that the the representatives from the feminist press are here because that's the same thing. It's finally archiving women's contributions to the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you're doing it about pop culture, you're doing really important work, and it's political work. Yeah, I'm going to just jump to the questioners because we don't have much time left. So I'll go to you, and then over there, and then you. <laughs> um. I know you guys addressed your like special ability specifically, but I wanted to know, as was, as was mentioned, your the redefinitions of power, because I thought that was interesting. Um, and also, how would like a college student like me in New York like be active, active in feminism? I know it's highly personal, but maybe some ideas mm -hmm. about the redefinitions of power and how to be active in the city of New York. Mm. Well, I just want to add on Melissa's special ability, because I do think that somebody's and this is related to power, some people are powerful working in institutions. Some people's power is man managing an institution and making that institution make sense. And other people's power is working on the outside of that institution. And I think the problem with power is that we see one thing as more powerful than the other. So those of us who don't have that executive director title are always a little bit like, what do I do again? And, and it's because we're still trying to fit ourselves into a narrow definition, but with more and more of us that have realized that what we uniquely contribute is the ability to make up our own careers and to stand in a different place, hopefully we're giving that example to other people who can say, oh wait, there's not this neat job for me, but maybe I'll do that two days a week and I'll do this two days a week. And so if that's something that speaks to you, I think you know, being able to harness what, where you feel like you're going to be the most effective. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, I think that it, there are a lot of different ways to, to express feminism. And I think the most important thing for, for me as a, as a person has been this sense of beginner's mind and lifelong learning. And college is a great place to mm -hmm. be someone who's learning because you're learning on an interpersonal level, you're learning about power dynamics, you're learning from books and you know, lectures and all this stuff. But I think that, that one thing that you can do as a feminist is to observe power and understand the history of power. And university um, bylaws, university practices, like hiring practices, um, the way that universities, um, you know, I mean, universities are power structures, I mean, incredible power structures that anchor um, parts of large parts of the society, and one of the things that you can do is just you know observe what's going on at your university and have a sense of you know how the money that you're contributing to the system of the university is being spent. I mean, I remember in college we had you know um, protests over you know women being excluded from these clubs, you know these things called you know um, finals clubs, and then protest over South Africa, and all of them had to do with, on some level, with university policy about private space, public space, university dollars. I mean, it, it's a great thing to observe, I think. Mm -hmm. Over here. Okay. Hi. I'm, I just wanted to congratulate the panel. We're in such a wonderful place, and I also wanted to say, I saw your film, I Had an Abortion, and I loved it. And I, I think, um, one of the reasons why I loved it is you can't have an abortion on network TV and not be sorry. So just talking about it, as one of your uh, people said. And so um, I, I, I teach here, and every 
little girl loves the dinner party and sometimes, and they've seen it before I even take my classes there. So this is just a, such a wonderful place to be, but I came from Planned Parenthood this morning and speaking of train wrecks, I just want to say, uh, we were talking about Proposition 8 earlier. Uh, I just want to mention the person's name, Stupac, and health care reform. <laughs> uh, there are petitions to sign put out by Planned Parenthood. This is going on this weekend. And um, one of the interesting things um, I'm doing is um, investigating crisis pregnancy centers. And I hope there's some journalists out here that can do it <laughs> and write about it. And um, also, but what I wanted to do since I'm in so many feminist organizations with the younger women, and you've talked about this a lot, is the difference of generations I'm seeing is the internet. Like I am on email all day signing petitions, but then I'm also actually escorting people to Planned Parenthood, you know, and they are going past some stuff that you would not believe is not a hate crime. Mm -hmm. You know, for a doctor to be shot in his church and it not be a hate crime, you know, um, so, and I keep saying to the kids, like, we'll have meetings and everybody's texting during the meetings, <laughs> you know, and um, I'm just wondering how we can sort of bridge that sort of uh, cultural, I mean, I feel like an old lady because I feel like saying to a younger woman, well, that's rude, you're texting right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm, almost, I'm starting to feel like my mom. So I'm wondering, like, if we can uh, talk about the internet and stuff. Well, I, yeah, I definitely don't know if there's anything that we can say that will get, um, you know, texting etiquette standardized <laughs> um, amongst teenagers or college students. I'm certainly guilty of it myself from time to time. I do think that the internet can be a really powerful force, not just for things like signing petitions, but for building a feminist community. I think a lot about how being a teenage feminist it used to be sort of, um, unless you were really lucky, a pretty lonely thing to grow up as. And now it really doesn't have to be because you can you know, find people who are just like you online and you can live a life in some ways with you know, online friends and colleagues and have this really supportive cohort that you might not have in your family or at school or in your town. And so I think that we need to um, be, to be not so judgmental of people, particularly young people who are increasingly living their lives online because I, I think it can be a really powerful way to, to, to live. They could be texting about Stupac. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm yeah. not that much of an optimist. I, yeah. I don't yeah. think they probably were, but you know, they potentially could be. But I do think that you know, it, it can be a really powerful tool, and it's something that we might not all understand, particularly those of us who grew up before the internet, but I think it's something that um, is inevitable and important, and I think it's more our job to adapt versus their job mm -hmm. to, um, you know, go to our ways. Of course, the importance of activism, you know, in real life and, and you know, showing up to things can't be underscored, and it sounds like, you know, you're doing very important work talking to them about that, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's a compromise. Mm -hmm. Is it okay with you if I go over here and get this question? I didn't see this. I, I must tell you how uh, thrilling it is to hear the words fourth wave. <laughs> uh, and my question is probably not going to have time here for answer, but I'd like to get on somebody's agenda in the future. Um, I, what, as a strategy for the fourth wave, what do you see uh, the role of the male? And can we, you know, encourage people, more male, to admit to being feminists and to become spokespersons or um, role models or some such thing? I think that in the fourth wave, and you're already sort of seeing this in the third wave, there's going to be no conflict for a guy to call himself a feminist. He won't be applauded for it. It won't be seen as very unique, and there's not, he's not going to personally feel mm -hmm. so exposed by doing it. Um, I mean, just even in Amy's and my travels, we've never had an event where there weren't men. 
um, and that this is hundreds of events now. So I think that men see themselves as part of this. And they were, you know, in the same way that we were, you know, Amy and I and everyone on this panel was raised with feminism in the water and all these important changes from the second wave of women's liberation. Young men were raised in that exact same environment. They were raised by single moms who gave them a Barbie, you know, and all that. You know, they were raised with the free same influences. You, yeah. The free to be you and me generation. And um, you see it in how unneurotically men claim feminism as an identity for themselves. And, and I think the next step, and this is something Amy talks about a lot, is, is really ma expressing feminism as a man on your own behalf. So not just as an ally to a woman, but what would it mean, how would it improve your life and the, and the life of society um, to be a feminist? And what's your particular, what's your special ability going to be and your contribution? <laughs> Because it relates to the question about power, because I think historically men have had the power, but I think we've seen in this generation that men have been as abused by that power as women have, and, and specifically some men who don't conform to traditional masculinity. And so I think they're becoming invested in changing the d definition of power too. And, and hopefully that can be even more realized in this generation. That said, I just want to say, I've been at a couple of meetings where this has come up, and I always use my Ask Amy as like a little radar, and when something comes up so many times, you're like, ugh. And is that so much of the girl positiveness that has happened over the last couple of years is being used to put boys in a state of crisis? And you see it with colleges. Most colleges, it's 60% women. And then how it's playing out is at the high school level. And I was just a meeting among sort of the very elite private schools on the Upper East Side of New York. And they were all saying, boys, you have to work. Girls are taking your spots away. You have to. And similarly, what we see at college campuses is people saying, you know, boys, you had to lose your wrestling program because we needed to keep the girls' volleyball program. But the way Title IX is, is it's not a tit for tat, it's a dollar amount. And it's like, no, 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 the reason you had to lose the boys wrestling is to preserve the boys football. It's not the girls gymnastics or the girls volleyball, but there's a lot I think in the rhetoric right now that is trying to say to men, women have taken away your power, but it's in these very subtle ways of, you know, getting internships for college and, and getting job potential and now girls are, so I think there's something a little dangerous out there too that we need to pay attention to. And you very generously, so. No, um, I was actually just um, wanting to ask a question about sort of like young women and their sexual expression because you talked a little bit, you know, you touched on um, the idea about sex work and the idea of agency in the pornography industry and the split, you know, about approval, disapproval with pornography and um, second wave feminism. But I'm just curious, you know, um, as someone who works with teenagers and someone who goes on the internet a lot, I mean, there's, you know, I'm just wondering, I feel like... Uh, I haven't, like I read, you know, Female Chauvinist Pigs when it came out like five years ago or whatever. And like I've, I haven't seen a lot of sophisticated dialogue in, you mm -hmm. know, academia about how to sort of deal with internet culture and the way that women are self-representing their sexuality and using, you know, sex, like sexually empowered, but where does that line get flipped around to where it's in an insidious way sort of disempowering or their agency really isn't there? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there are entire porn websites that just draw on MySpace and Facebook for their pictures of mm -hmm. underage girls. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to speak to, and you know, there is a lot of slippage about, you know, whether or not, you know, um, consent age like really represents like where agency can be. And I don't want to speak to like, you know, um, you know, that the legal definitions are entirely, you know, where these like ideas should come from. But mm -hmm. I'm just not sure what sort of feminism has to offer in terms of a critique of sort of like women self-representing and it may be not having to do with agency always or where that line can be drawn and how that can be explored? Well, I, I think first of all, you can just be honest um, in the dialogue and say, look, you may represent yourself one way and other people will see it a completely different way. Mm -hmm. You may be standing against a wall and someone may see you in a provocative pose. That doesn't mean that you're standing in a provocative pose, but people see different things. Likewise, a future employer of yours may see something very mm -hmm. different when they see a picture of you. It may not have anything to do, I mean, like you have to kind of disengage the um, intention from the artifact. And I think we have to start talking about artifact culture. You know, when you take a, 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 a you, when you have a JPEG, a picture that goes up online, it may be virtual, but it's still an artifact of a moment. But how people interpret that artifact is different. 
And I think people then don't feel as judged. You're not saying that was a slutty picture. You're saying this picture is interpreted as slutty by these people. It's interpreted as pornography by these people. It's interpreted as fun by you and your friends. It's interpreted as threatening by your ex-boyfriend. It's like uh, uh, people can put all sorts of things onto the artifact. But if you understand that artifact culture leaves a permanent record and that mm -hmm. pictures on Facebook are never deleted and that yeah. huge amounts of Facebook's budget go to preserving all of the server space to maintain every picture you've ever deleted from Facebook, let alone the ones that are still up, then you understand artifact culture better. And it's not about judging someone's you know, individual artifact, the intention behind it, it's about talking about the realities of it. And I think people get that, you know, teenagers can get that. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for coming. And thank Sackler for hosting us in the Brooklyn Museum. And now we can continue this conversation at the reception, which I'm assuming will be self-evident how to find. Fourth floor. Fourth floor. Okay. Up one floor. Okay, oh, okay, fourth floor in the center itself. So hopefully we can continue talking there. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.